Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Uncle Sam in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and yes, I'm wearing this shirt for a third Kill Count, because today we're looking at Uncle Sam, released in 1996. Or 1997, the internet doesn't seem to know. If you're like me, you probably expected a movie with a murderous Uncle Sam to be a mindless slasher with a perfunctory pro-America message behind it. But Uncle Sam is not that. The script, written by Larry Cohen of the It's Alive and Maniac Cop series, tries to deliver a message about the difference between being a good soldier and being a good killer, but it gets bogged down in an effort to touch on pretty much everything else related to the military too. Corrupt officers, PTSD, the morality of draft dodging, you name it, it's here. Then shit gets really weird, and before you know it, you've got Isaac Hayes and a telepathic blind kid shooting cannonballs at a zombie soldier. But let's back up a bit, because before that thrilling conclusion, there are a fair number of kills to see, so let's get to them. The movie begins in Kuwait, a country we used to fight in. It was like 10 countries ago. There's been a helicopter accident in the desert, so this major with a Saddamish mustache shows up to direct the situation with a voice that sounds part panzer tank. Get in that helicopter. See if you can ID anybody by their tags. Sergeant Sillyface takes a look at the crash and finds two dead bodies in there that we can go ahead and kick off our count with. Apparently, this chopper was shot down by friendly fire. And even though the major's all like, hey, shit happens, that's not good enough for Master Sergeant Sam Harper, whose body they find in the front seat of the chopper. Cause Sam opens his eyes, reaches out, and twists the other sergeant's head around in an excellent lightning strike kill to keep the count going. Sam takes the sergeant's firearm and shoots through the guy's body to hit the major at least twice, maybe more, in a very subordinate kill. Someone's looking to get court-martialed, but Sam don't care, he's full of spite about the accident. Don't be afraid. It's only friendly fire. And then he dies, question mark? I mean, he does, but he'll be back as a zombie. But still, let's throw him on the count anyway. Keep that shit going. Cue the title card. Hell yeah, these opening credits. I love patriotic imagery backed by John Philip Sousa. Seriously though, this old footage of Times Square and other historical stuff is actually pretty cool. Plus, I like Ike. Then we jump to the town of Twin Rivers in the state of USA. Looks like America's birthday is only three days away, and I still don't know what to get it. This little wienery kid Jody jostles around in bed for a while, before he knocks over a framed picture of his Uncle Sam Harper, the murderous chap from the chopper. Jody steps on the broken glass and cuts his foot, and that, uh, does something to Sam's corpse? There's some weird Stephen King-like magic going on in this movie. Just wait till we get to Barry. While Jody gets his foot patched up from his mom Sally, he tells her he dreamt about his Uncle Sam, and judging by the kid's infatuation with the guy, it was probably a wet one. Meanwhile, Sam's wife Louise gets home from a date with Deputy Phil, since Sam's been gone for three years, and she assumes he must be dead at this point. <laughs> at least as dead as the romance in this car. Sorry, deputy, she's exercising her right to leave you with some blue balls. Waiting on her porch is creepy Sergeant Twining, played by Bo Hopkins, who tells her that her husband is dead and that he'll stay in town long enough to help with all the funeral arrangements. The next morning, after Jody drools all into his bowl of cereal, Louise tells Sally about her visit from Sergeant Twining. They both seem to have a complicated reaction to the news, bordering on relief because it sounds like Sam was a real asshole who had them both terrified of him. Maybe he just wanted to terrorize one of them but couldn't tell them apart. I know I'm having a hard time here. Jody, meanwhile, still thinks his uncle is a hero and is such a Sam fan that in school later that day, he just forces a goddamn show-and-tell session with all of Sam's medals. It makes his teacher Mr. Crandall a little uncomfortable, probably because he was a Vietnam protester who left the country rather than fight what he thought was an unjust war. It was a very difficult thing to do, Jody. Those who left the country felt it was a lesser evil and blindly following orders they knew were wrong. Jody and his camo pants think that sounds like pinko talk, and he swears to himself that he's gonna grow up and join the army. And I'll do whatever the president says to do, because he knows better. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's chain of command. It just sounds a little scary when you hear it like that. He repeats that pledge to join the service to Sergeant Twining when he gets home, where his Uncle Sam's body has been delivered for, you know, funeral stuff. On his way out, Twining takes the opportunity to get just a tad too handsy with Sally, and later that night, in his Apocalypse Now-themed hotel room, we hear him on the phone confirming that he's a nasty boy. I am on getting a little piece of that action before I leave here. Shit, he even says that the main reason he took this job is so he could get a bunch of widow trim. Dude's a total sleazebag, unlike the other sergeant in town, local Jed Crowley, who's played by Isaac Hayes and is introduced with the best first line ever. Too many rolls and jelly donuts. Whereas Twining is suffering from creeperitis, Jed's got a legit case of survivor's guilt since he was the only one from his squad to make it home alive. God, how come it was me you let come home? Sally has her beau Ralph over for dinner and lack of kisses. Ralph's also depicted as a skis since he's a lawyer celebrating a recent courtroom victory wherein he defended some tax shelters. You mean you cheated them? 
I'm just smarter than they are, Jody. That's all. This may be the only movie I've ever seen with the message of, hey, make sure you pay the IRS your fair share. That night, Jody wears an amazing fucking dinosaur shirt. That's all I wanted to say. I don't really need to talk about this scene. But I did need to mention that dinosaur shirt. The next day, Jed comes over to the closed casket wake and apologizes for encouraging Sam to join the army. He strikes up a convo with Jody about his wooden leg that he got after a landmine messed him up in Korea, but assures the little kid that, hey, don't worry, the dicks still work, I All those other parts made it back just fine. Jody mentions that he wants to join the service, and Jed fucking and loses it, yelling about how things ain't like the old Nazi fighting days. When we knew who and what we were fighting for. Jody claps back with a patriotic fervor, arguing that everyone's gotta die someday and the army needs people to fight, so fuck it, you know? Jed's like, shit, kid, you're a real piece of work. And they talk about how heroism doesn't just mean killing people. That night, when the clock strikes 4th of July o'clock, Slimy Sam awakens inside his coffin, apparently summoned by this trio of teens who are just checking everything off on the list of ways to be offensive. Let's see, you got a spray-painted swastika, a celebration of the Texas v. Johnson decision, and some pretty straightforward gravesite desecration. It's enough to get Sam up and running to defend America's honor, but not before sneaking into Jody's room and grabbing all of his medals to pin to his burnt leathery flesh. Wouldn't want to be walking around looking like a fresh recruit zombie soldier, you know? His medals leave him looking much more respectable than this peeping Sam, some perv named Willie who's using his stilt legs to deliver the movie's requisite gratuitous nudity. After this unlikely act of voyeurism, Willie makes a second story getaway until he winds up in a park being stalked down by Master Sergeant Sam Harper. Willie ends up running into a tree and falling onto his back, where he doesn't even try to put up a fight or move as Sam comes after him with a pair of garden shears. I hope you got a knife. Oh. The death happens off screen, as does the corpse looting, since Sam steals Willie's clothes and uses the bloody shears to make some alterations. His newly tailored attire provides a snazzy outfit to wear to the cemetery, where one of those vandals is straggling back from his friends to take a piss. Sam literally pops up to spray the kid Rick in the face, getting him so mad he can only see red. Rick passes out and wakes up inside Sam's open grave, covered in red, white, and blue paint, and also suffering from a compound fracture in his leg. In a very patient kill, Sam buries Rick to death by shoveling dirt on him, slowly but sedulously, until nothing Nothing but his hand is above ground. He finishes the kill with another weird one-liner. Good night. One of Rick's friends, some guy named Cleet, is that a typo? Comes back to see why Rick's lizard draining is taking so long, and fails to notice Sam with his passive perception. So he winds up with a flagpole halyard around his neck. Which, yes, is a term I learned writing this script. Cause learning is fun. Sam feels a bit naughty, so he runs Cleet up the flagpole and sees, who salutes, but no one ever does. Instead, Cleet's neck breaks and he goes on the kill count. I guess Sam thought it was a sin for him to live so well. The next day, it's time for the 4th of July parade, and Mr. Crandall's flustered that his very sassy George Washington can't find his hatchet. When he goes back into the classroom to get it, he finds it. Lodged right in his fucking forehead, courtesy of Master Sergeant Sam Harper. Try dodging that, you goddamn hippie. Jed kicks off the festivities with a real live cannon, which, like, where did that cannonball go? The subsequent parade is a real big small town celebration full of local pageantry and ursine anti-arson activists. Halloween's PJ Souls pops into the movie as Madge Cronin, alongside her husband Mac, who's played by Tom McFadden, Lisa's dad in Nightmare 2. Their son Barry was blinded at last year's celebration due to a fireworks mishap, and Mama Cronin is hoping to make everyone feel totally guilty by wheeling Barry around. Cheer up, Barry. At least you get to listen to this goofy band the Abe Lincoln story. Jesse, the third 90s fuckboy from the cemetery, steps on stage to help kick off the evening with a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. But after a promising start, he winds up Roseanning the whole damn thing. By the dust, early light. What's so he finishes off his performance with a half moon, which pisses off Uncle Sam. Maybe he'd respect you more if you went full bare ass. How many times we gotta tell you, Jesse? No half measures. While the mayor recovers with a proper recital of the anthem, Barry gets his face felt on by Uncle Sam. Some weird kind of connection forms between them, and honestly, Uncle Sam, there is not enough movie left to start doing shit like this. You know me. I don't think I do anymore. While Uncle Sam wanders through the crowd, glad handing all the good little patriots, local congressman Alvin Cummings, played by Robert Forrester, shows up in an effort to rehabilitate his image after a recent financial scandal. Maybe he was using taxpayer funds to bail out attractive flight attendants caught smuggling drugs. Or maybe he's just there for these Flintstone-sized dinosaur ribs that this barbecue chick is hacking up with true culinary finesse. After she sneaks off to smoke a dupe, she comes back to cook some more ribs on weed, only to find her cleaver missing. That can't be good news for these saucy little spuds who are starting a potato sack race. It's an extended sequence with a bland rock backing, and during it, Jesse really puts the sack in sack race by running around 
around and knocking into all the other competitors. Holy shit, he even kicks them while they're down? What a little turd weasel. Thankfully, he gets his comeuppance after tripping down a hill and taking a serious no-hands tumble. Good stunt work there. On his way through a lemon grove to get back to the race, he runs into Sam, who apparently also has the ability to teleport. No, seriously, check it out. This is some Jason Takes Manhattan level teleportation. Bam! And after appearing right in front of Jesse, he takes the stolen cleaver and frickin' hacks the dude's head off. Hell yeah, mad all that 90s hair up with blood. I guess despite all his cheating, Jesse won't be getting ahead in that race after all. After spying on his wife, widow, unwidow, Sam steals a rifle from a carnival game and apparently uses it to murder Ralph, who Sally finds sitting atop a parade float taking his Abe Lincoln role just a bit too seriously. Six Semper Tyrannus, motherfuckers! Deputy Phil checks out the body while Sally noms on popcorn and Jody talks shit about the dead, saying he wasn't even a patriot and deserved what he got. At dusk, in a random barn, Jody's family gets into another conversation about the late Uncle Sam when the women express concern about how much the young boy idolizes him. Louise tells Jody that Sam abused her so much she was in fear for her life, and despite Jody's initial reluctance to square away this cognitive dissonance, he comes around after his mom lays down this heavy shit. I know it's an awful thing to say, but I was so happy the day that he got married and moved out of the house, because then he'd have another victim instead of me. Whew, damn man, this movie gets strangely deep in between all the sack races and barbecuing. Speaking of barbecues, the grill girl is our next victim after she opens up her meat smoker to find Jesse's head getting cooked well done. She's killed off screen when Sam grabs her and makes her head join Jesse's on the grill. The mayor takes after his Amity Island idol and encourages folks to just carry on with their 4th of July festivities despite the recent deaths. He goes to introduce the fireworks only for the spotlight to fall on Congressman Cummings, strapped against some wooden lattices with a handful of sparklers sticking out of his suit. At the fireworks control panel is Uncle Sam, who starts flipping switches and lighting these bad boys off. The crowd has a weirdly uneven reaction to the sight until Sam hits the final switch and kills off Cummings for good with a giant explosion. That finally gets them concerned. The blast ends up blowing Deputy Phil backwards down a hill, at the bottom of which Sam is waiting for him with the stars and stripes. Not the stars and bars, that's the Confederate flag, and I'm real sorry for making that mistake in Purge Election Year. Phil falls straight onto the flagpole and gets impaled through the back for a pretty solid and decently gory kill. Even had some guts coming out there, not bad Uncle Sam. After Barry's parents run out of the movie, he tells Jody not to worry about the killer running around because somehow, through the power of uh, touch or whatever, he knows that it's Jody's Uncle Sam. My Uncle Sam? But he's dead. I never said he wasn't. This movie's something else, man. Jed finds the kids and tries to usher them out of this war zone, and that's when they tell him their theory that the killer is Jody's undead uncle. Jed doesn't like it. I'm too old for this crap. Cut it out! But after they go back to Jody's house to double check the casket, they find some supporting evidence for the theory when, instead of Sam, the body inside is Creepy Sergeant Twining, dead of what looks to be a slit throat. Damn, was hoping for something more on screen for this creeper, but what are you gonna do? Now that Jed is on board with the whole undead soldier theory, he and the kids head to Louise's house where they find her striking a real nice Norman Bates pose. After she calms down, Jed upgrades her weapon to a ranged attack and goes to use her phone. In the kitchen, Jed discovers the Uncle Sam mask before he's outright confronted by the burnt up undead Sam. Sam Harper, who blames Jed for his current condition. Jed says no F that ish. Sam just killed for the sake of killing instead of for the sake of his country. He tells him to go on and get, but Sam responds by throwing Jed through the living room partition in yet another solid stunt. That's maybe the best thing this movie has going for it. After Sam walks into the living room and takes a few shots from Louise, she and Jed run off to go get the town cannon while Jody stays behind to fake sympathy for Sam. Jed quickly hitches the cannon to his Made in America Ford truck and brings it back to Louise's house where, what, Barry was just chilling by himself on the sidewalk this whole time? What the fuck, adults? Sam tells Jody that he's back from the dead to recruit the little lad for, I, I don't know, zombie soldier shit, I guess? But in order to join him, Jody will have to be dead first. Are you volunteering? Jody knows that volunteer work looks great on college applications, so he takes Sam's hand and goes to step outside onto the porch with him. It's all part of a ruse, but Jody still chooses some very weird phrasing for his fake proclamations. Can you all see us? We belong together. At Barry's precocious insistence, Jed lights the cannon fuse and Jody gets the hell out of the way. The cannon lands right in front of Sam with a huge fiery explosion that knocks Jody down. But of course, it doesn't actually finish off Uncle Sam, because here he comes out of the flames in a pretty good fire stunt that features one of those creepy looking fire suits masks. But everyone knows that Chef has two balls, so Jed loads another one into the cannon to put an end to this extended fire stunt. With another lighting of the fuse, he fires a second cannonball that lands a direct hit on Uncle Sam, sending him flying back into the house, which inexplicably friggin' explodes. Yo, what was Louise doing in that house of hers? Cooking up a whole bunch of meth? <laughs> Whatever brought this explosion about, all I know is that Barry is fucking pumped about it. Yo, 
All right! The movie ends with Jody burning all of his war toys, because, like, fuck the ozone layer, before turning back towards the camera in a very unnecessary slow motion shot that turns into an even more unnecessary shattering glass effect. Who was making these decisions? Can this mess of a movie be salvaged by a decent body count? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, whoo, that was loud. 16 people died in Uncle Sam, including Uncle Sam himself, twice. The victims consisted of 15 guys and only a single girl, giving us a pie chart that's even more imbalanced than usual. With a runtime of 89 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average about every five and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Deputy Phil Burke. There were a couple other contenders, but Phil wins out because he was killed with an American flag. It just feels like my duty to give it to him. Dull machete for lamest kill goes to Ralph, whose body is discovered with a pinpoint-sized fake bullet wound in the side of his head. Yo, Lincoln got shot in the back of the head, movie. And that's it. Uncle Sam came out in 1996 and was directed by William Lustig, who also directed those Maniac Cop movies as well as the earlier film Maniac. I hope you all have a happy 4th of July, and I'll be back on Friday with a brand new franchise. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey, thanks a lot for watching This Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Sam Gazi and Aaron Mounts. Happy 4th of July, everyone. I hope you celebrate it safely. On Friday, we start a brand new Kill Count series that will go on for four weeks. After that is another small series that will last three weeks, and then it will be August 24th, which is Halloween time. I mean, Halloween like Kill Count time. It won't actually be the Halloween holiday. That's October 31st. All right, y'all be good people.